A beautiful afternoon to you and many thanks for joining us on the program flip side with your sincerely Oloi J. Uikohai. Today on Flipside, we're looking at World Hemophilia Day. And to discuss with us is the person of Dr. Wongo Benedict, a ace consultant, hematologist, University of Benin Teaching Hospital. Now, before we um, go to Dr. Wongo Benedict, it's pleasant to know that World Hemophilia Day was first celebrated on the 17th of April. 1986 by the World Federation of Hemophilia. Um, Dr. Wongo, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Nice Pleasure. to have you here today. Thank you. Now, uh, the World Health Organization, an international body, has decided, has deemed it fit to celebrate today being World Hemophilia Day. Now, first off, someone out there might not know the meaning of hemophilia. So I want you to educate us, enlighten us, let us in on what is the meaning, what is that word, hemophilia? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the word hemophilia from, is it gotten from two words, him meaning blood, mm -hmm. and philia, tendency towards something. So hemophilia simply means tendency to bleed. Mm -hmm. Okay? So is a group of genetic disease that is characterized by increased tendency to bleed. Mm. There are several disorders that can make somebody bleed, mm. but this particular, particular group, okay, they are due to either deficiency or lack or abnormality of some important blood clotting proteins in our body. And when the defect is there, usually, in most cases, they are genetic, mm -hmm. meaning they can be inherited from okay. parents. Okay. However, there is a subset of patients or group mm -hmm. that can have the assets acquired. Mm -hmm. So once they have the defect in that particular clotting protein, yeah. it results to their inability to form clots when they have an injury. Mm -hmm. So they tend to bleed more than usual. Okay. So that's the word hemophilia. Oh, okay. So, so why um, do we see this day being celebrated? It's important. The essence of WHO creating days of celebrating mm. health conditions, they are importantly to raise awareness. Yeah. And raising awareness is important because a vast number of the populace are ignorant mm. about their condition. Mm. They may carry different needs, mm. different local beliefs, about it, some of which may result into practices that mm. may result into untimely death mm. and probably disability mm. in persons who are affected. So days like this that will raise awareness, mm. they help us to reach out to as much persons as possible so that they can avail themselves the opportunity to get help and the needed assistance to live a healthy and normal life. Okay, so what are the symptoms? Now, someone that has hemophilia and doesn't even know that I have hemophilia. So what are the symptoms that this person will see to know that, okay, I need to go to the hospital because this is frequent and I'm not getting healed as normal. So what are these symptoms? Okay, I, I discuss may span beyond hemophilia so that mm. the number of persons may have other bleeding-related conditions mm. so that they can benefit. If you are walking and you have a cut, a minor cut, it's expected that within a few minutes, okay. a clot should form, yes, and yes. that should be all. Mm. Or you have a heat on a hard surface, you don't expect to have any bleed. But there is some group of persons, either they hit their body on surface or even contact. Mm. They bleed into their tissues and it swells. Okay. That swelling is a sign that there's blood accumulating in mm. that tissue. Mm. So that could be a sign. But most importantly, since it's genetic, the symptoms often tend to start, in most instances, just after birth. Mm. It's commonly a disease that affects males. Okay. But it's not to say that females cannot be affected. Females mm. can be affected. But majority of our population affected, they are males. Mm. So males, the first encounter they may have may be following circumcision. Okay. So at circumcision, 
You see a child bleeding uncontrollably. Mm. And sometimes we have to be admitted and probably transfused. Mm. So that's the first, the commonest pointer to say there is something mm. wrong and we should seek care. Mm. And then as a child grows, maybe a little contact bleeds, mm. a fall, the body begins to swell. That is also a pointer. Or those who, are the, who have tooth problems and they go to, for tooth extractions and they bleed uncontrollably. Mm. So these are some little, little triggers. Mm. So, and as they grow, they get involved in contact sports or activities. A little activity, you see them, they are traumatized. You see swelling mm. and the child is crying uncontrollably. Yeah. So those are pointers that there is something wrong. Mm, okay. Now, apart from hemophilia, now, is there another name that a common man can just call the name? Is there, is there a, a simple name? If ah. you don't want to call it hemophilia, maybe someone is saying, oh, I'm having this disorder. Which other name can a, a layman understand to say, okay, this is what is happening to me? If for the general population, if you use the word, you have a bleeding condition. Okay. That's for a, a medic or a physician may mm. easily understand. You have a bleeding condition. Mm. I, have, I have an injury, I have a cut, and it's refusing to heal. heal. Mm. That's enough is, is sufficient. Okay. We want to look for deeper names. The hemophilia is a spectrum of disease. Mm. So we will have um, hemophilia A, hemophilia B. In fact, hemophilia B has a sweet name. It's called Christmas disease. <laughs> okay? So, but just say you have a tendency to bleed. That's sufficient to pass a message to mm. a physician who can, you know, uh, resolve with him or self, know probably what to likely do, okay. and probably refer the person to a blood specialist. Okay. Now, so what distinguishes hemophilia from other bleeding disorder, and how does it impact those living with it? Yeah. Hemophilia specifically has to do with defects in some blood clotting proteins. Mm. Now, the spectrum of our system to arrest bleed is complex. There are different layers of defense mm. that God has put in place mm. to, um, to arrest the bleed. In a healthy person, the layers of tissues, mm. the first lining of tissue, are leading with some contractile ability to contract. Mm. That contraction of the vessels and the mm. smooth muscles around the injured area will be the first protective mechanism. Yeah. If the injury is minute, that contraction may just be adequate okay. to limit the bleeding. But when that fails, another group of layer comes where our blood clotting subfragments of cells are called platelets. Mm. They come to form a plug around the injured site. That plug helps to seal any defect. But if that fails, now the clotting proteins they come. Yeah. So those clotting proteins will, will come, aggregate, form a fibrin network. Mm. That fibrin is supposed to seal off the injured area mm. and accept and uh, arrest the bleed. So these okay. are three major layers yes. of defense. Mm. So those involving hemophilia often have to deal with the clotting factor. That's the third layer mm. of defense. Mm. And the injuries or bleeding resulting from defects in this level of defense commonly results to bleeding into tissues. So they tend to bleed into muscles, yeah. okay? Yeah. And then very severe ones may bleed into surfaces like skin mm. or their mucous membranes, so that's how. But people who have strictly blood vessel problem that is not due to a clotting protein, yeah. because the blood vessel is the first layer of defense, their bleeding tends to be limited to the surfaces. Mm -hmm. They have patches yeah. either on their skin or on their mucous membranes. That's where the patches are often uh, localized. Then beyond that is the platelets. The platelets are involved. The bleeding is also limited to surfaces like the skin mm -hmm. and the mucous linings. So you can have people who, like for females, for instance, they can have heavy menstrual flow. Okay. okay. They brush their teeth, they may see blood mm. when they brush. Yeah, Others are pointers, injured. Gum injured. Mm. So these are pointers to either a defect in vessel mm. or defects in our platelets. Okay? But when tissues, bleeding into tissues is where the uh, clotting proteins are most important. They bleed into tissues, bleed into joint surfaces. Mm. And that could result to significant morbidity. Mm. 
bleeding into joints may result into joint disease. Okay. They develop serious joint okay. ache and can result in deformities. Mm. They get deformed and may not be able to walk very well. Yeah. They can also be bleed into their central nervous system, the brain. Okay. And that could be very fatal, yeah. really. They can result to loss of consciousness. Mm. But bleeding into joints, like you asked, what's the impact on their health? A child who has a tendency to, to bleed, even if the mother does not know what the disease is, generally will exempt that child mm. from playing with other children. True. Okay? And that has impact too on the psychology of the child. Mm. The child's quality of life is reasonably uh, impaired. Mm. Cannot play with mates, yeah. both at school. Being, being restricted. Yes, being yeah. restricted. So it does a lot of harm mm. to the child. Mm. They cannot be involved in certain sports, mm. any contact, activities. Yes. Properly, they cannot. Yes. So that's highly limiting. Mm. And then if they happen to have deformity, either because of repeated bleeds, yeah. it restricts, become deformed really. Mm. And it impacts their ability to even engage in their normal work life. Mm. So the impact is enormous. For the parents and all those around them, it could be a lot of a lot of challenge to mm -hmm. having to rush this child to seek health care or the sight of seeing your world, you know, unable to perform optimally. That's uh, quite traumatic, both to parents and to the children themselves. Okay, yes. Um, you talked about women. Now, this brings to mind, because I had to jot that down, not to forget specifically, now, for pregnant women, we know some go, go through normal delivery yeah. and some through the C-section. How will a doctor know that this pregnant lady now that wants to go through either the C-section or through the normal delivery? Because we also know that normal delivery, there are sometimes you have to do have some court and all yeah. of that. Now, especially the C-section, we know it's, it goes through, um, what do you call it now? Um, um, yes, surgery yeah. and all of that, yeah. So, so someone that has hemophilia, in as much as you said, is not yeah. common in women. Yeah. Now, in 100, you can have maybe like one or two persons. Now, this person has to be a, a woman that has hemophilia. What will be the action of the doctor? What will the doctor do at that point in time? Okay, it's, it's really very important, and I think... Um, uh, physicians, especially the obstetricians who yeah. are involved in women's health, they are also too increasingly aware of such challenges. Okay. Besides hemophilia, there's a condition called von Willebrand disease. It's also a bleeding disorder. Von Willebrand disease. Okay. It's also a bleeding condition, okay. somewhat even commoner than hemophilia itself. Mm. And there are also two other acquired medical conditions yeah. that can cause women who are at the point of giving birth to bleed. Mm -hmm. So increasingly, obstetricians are making it a duty okay. to screen women who are to undertake such procedures. Mm -hmm. Even the surgeons generally, it's mm -hmm. traditionally become their routine mm -hmm. to make sure people who are undergoing surgery has a blood clotting screen. Okay. So that could be the point to detect mm -hmm. there is something wrong. Yeah. And uh, oftentimes, there are interventions that can be made so that if the woman has to go for surgery, mm. the surgery can be done successfully. Okay, all right. So now, could um, actually, could we share personal narrative? Is there any personal narrative we can share from individual uh, perspective? Like maybe something you have seen over time, shedding light into the unique experience and challenges into the issues of hemophilia? Yeah, there are quite a number of experience both from children to adults mm. and uh, even pregnant women too. Mm. Now, for, for children, there are quite a number of conditions. Like a couple of weeks back, a, a parent brought the child to the hospital. Mm. He's registered with the, with the hospital okay. and has been known in the past to have a bleeding condition. For the first visit, the child came with very intense headache. Hmm. very intense headache and the suspicion of a, a tender and they, they did a scan yes and they found that there was blood collection in the child's brain and then um, we were notified the child was screened and was found actually to be hemophilic okay. but following that 
appropriate measures were given. Mm. The child received um, appropriate therapy and recovered and uh, was discharged. Mm. But something happened shortly, several months later, a similar occurrence happened. And because there was some form of shortage in what is required to correct that deficit, mm. Though the child got some, but the dosing seemed not to have adequately Amen. controlled that bleed. Okay. And unfortunately, the child bled into the brain, the bleeding expanded, and we lost the child. Mm. There are also some that ended well. We've had patients who have, were known hemophilic, and because they are identified, mm. so they came, they had a reason to undergo surgery. Mm. And for some, really, the doctors did not know, but they had done surgery and mm. found that this person kept bleeding. Yeah. So our team were notified and promptly we were able to raise appropriate therapies for mm. them. There are mm. factors that we used to treat them mm. to replace that deficit uh, protein. Yeah. And they were lucky we had enough factors to support them and it was successful. So I had a couple of experience, some before surgery. We provide a lot of support to make sure that they have uneventful surgeries. Mm -hmm. and, uh, once identified, there's enough uh, support that mm -hmm. can be gained to make sure whatever medical conditions the child or uh, individual is going through, mm -hmm. you could have support to go through it successfully. Mm -hmm. Though we may lose some, but a few compared to when we are not aware okay. uh, of the condition. Okay, so we're well, invariably saying identification is very important, it's Very, key. very important. Okay. Yeah. All right, so how does this um, stigma surrounding hemophilia um, affect individuals and also looking at its quality of lives and what measures can be taken to combat um, this stigma? Um, this stigma regards hemophilia is not so conspicuous. Okay. Because Besides occasions of bleed, they live almost as every other normal, normal individual. Life, yeah. But stigma may now arise probably in the course of life, yeah. either they have had very serious bleed that resulted into some form of disability, yeah. like who have joint mm -hmm. problems. Mm -hmm. So that can limit their ability to live their usual normal life, mm -hmm. even ability to walk, okay, may limit their job opportunities mm -hmm. and things like that. So those are the major major challenges. Mm -hmm. So once complication sets in, it becomes really, uh, that's where it impacts negatively mm -hmm. on quality of life. But the key thing is that as much as possible, these conditions are identified early. Okay. There are key supports that may help mm -hmm. the, the affected persons to provide even those factors they need, even when they do not have the crisis. Okay. So that factor provided can be taken as preventive factors to limit their tendencies to bleed. Mm. And that can make them live a near complete normal life. So it's important knowing what the condition is, that's the beginning mm. of the hallmark to live out your full life. So okay. that's, that's okay. the point. Now you gave a story of a child that was, um, had an issue and because the doctor did not know that the child was hemophilic, now, it went into um, disorder and it wasn't managed properly. Now, what are the awareness given to doctors? By virtue of training, okay, by virtue of training, mm -hmm. the, the, the topic bleeding disorders is a major part of the curriculum of, of um, medical trainees. Okay. So, at 400 level, they're exposed mm -hmm. and even all through their program at every level, okay. from 400 level, they're mm. exposed to uh, some classes on bleedings. And during their course of postings to this spare reasonable time, both in medical and surgical units especially, mm. and even in obstetrics, where they can find or have encounters with patients who have abnormal bleedings. Mm -hmm. But just that following graduation from med school, mm. people may specialize into different you units. Think, yeah. And depending on the scope of where you practice, Sometimes you may know what to do, but where you practice, you may be limited in, in terms of capacity. Mm. You may have, you may practice in a facility where they do not have the capacity to do basic textings okay. that may help you identify mm. this is what the problem is. Mm. So sometimes you work on some of being highly suspicious. This is probably what I'm dealing with, okay. but it's good to have an evidence mm. which is objectively assessing 
what the problem is. Mm. So besides having knowledge, sometimes the environment where you practice can limit your capacity mm. to really do what is expected of you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're saying it depends on where you practice. Yeah, where you practice is important. Okay. And that is why it is good as much as possible. So certain basics should be made available in every health care facilities. Okay. Mm. All right, now I'm um, talking about hemophilia. Are there any prevalent myth? Um, misconceptions that hemophilia that we are not prevailed to yeah there are a number of myths mm -hmm. one of which says if somebody who's hemophilic and has a cut will die okay. that's not very true if you're hemophilic you have a cut you get access to your doctor promptly and you are given appropriate treatment mm -hmm. all will be well and then even you can be given factors preventively so that even if you have a cult, it will follow the normal paths mm. as every other normal person. Mm. So that's a one myth that um, should be taken off our minds. Another could be that hemophilia do not live long. Mm. Okay? Yes, there are things that may suggest, like things I've just mentioned, if you do not know your status, or probably you know your status and you're not getting appropriate support yeah. to take care of your condition, it could actually affect your lifespan. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, there is increasing access to support that can make them live out their life to, to near normal. Another could be that females are not hemophilic. Mm -hmm. That's not true. It's a disease predominantly affecting males, but females can be affected. affected so also. a female can present mm -hmm. with symptoms, so we should know that. That is not so. There are a number of myths like that. Okay. Mm. Okay. So apart from this day, today now, is there any other day that um, you, as a doctor and every other person, goes go out to sensitize the public concerning um, hemophilia? Um, the, the the day provides us a, a wide opportunity to make use of both the media, but in our various forms, we have um, some some groups. Okay. okay, some of which are patient groups, mm. because this is a disease that we run in families, and that's key. Mm. Hereditary. Bro hereditary. Mm. So if a family member is involved okay. and is informed, can begin to actually trace their families, okay. or hear of any family member with limited symptoms, mm. can you know intervene and direct the patient to appropriate care, where they can get a, a, a good care. So I think through patient groups, okay. we are raising awareness. awareness. Okay. Then doctors to have forum mm. where they relate with themselves and they mm. discuss uh, similar issues. Okay. So patient group and then the medical groups will do that. But this okay. day provides us a very good opportunity to reach a vast number of, of the okay, public. Okay, audience. Yeah. Yes. All right. Now, when we're, talk when we're talking about hemophilia, we know that sometimes you don't get access to medication you don't get access to treatment. So how can one go about having access to drugs, to treatment, to even seeing the doctors? Are there specific doctors assigned to an hemophilic patient? Yes. I am a hematologist. Okay. Hematologist deals with blood disorders, including bleeding disorders. Mm. So um, the other medical experts who are probably known hematologists, they also know okay. that it is the responsibility of the hematologist to precisely deal with such conditions. Mm -hmm. So if you present even to any other physician mm -hmm. that is not a hematologist, mm -hmm. it is your onus to make a referral to the hematologist who mm -hmm. should handle such conditions. So besides that, um, there is a group who are trying to aggregate the patient populations who are affected mm -hmm. because truly, um, supporting patients with hemophilia requires a lot. The problem is they lack a factor. That factor, their system is defective and cannot produce that particular factor. Okay. And what's the care? The care needed is that either you replace that factor by trying to provide blood, because you give a normal blood that has a factor, you can give them to replace whatever is defective. Mm. But that also has its own risk. Giving blood, the risk of transmitting infections mm. is also high. Mm. The risk of fluid overload is high. The mm. number of other challenges that may come with blood transfusions. Okay. So, with science, innovations are in place. They have developed 
specific factors mm. to replace those factors. Okay. And that could come really with huge costs. Mm. So global organizations are working together to see how they can you know, address those challenges. Like Novo Nordics, they have worked to develop factors and they're increasingly making it available for, for patient populations mm. to have access to it. And having a good number, that's also the essence of this awareness. Mm. The more persons we can assess who have these conditions, the larger the group, the more likely they will get support. Okay. So the more we are, the more we can be able to uh, reach out to support groups mm. that can help provide the needed support to these key populations. Mm. So in Nigeria, there's a foundation. They are trying to aggregate patient population to interact with international support groups to see how they can also assess this particular factor to help manage the condition. Innovations have also brought about production of other protein molecules mm -hmm. that can specifically address this condition for persons who may be getting those factors, but mm -hmm. here develop some problems, some okay. complications. Yeah. So they have innovated, and even to the point of genetic therapy okay. for this condition. So I think the support is there. So it is hopeful if we can aggregate a large population size who are affected, that will increase the the, the, the probably the international awareness and also attract more support for the patient group. Okay. All right, sir. So, uh, we're talking about Ward Hemophilia Day. It's a blood disorder in case, or bleeding disorder in case you don't know or in case you just turned on your TV set. Now, um, discussing with me has been Dr. Wongo Benedict. He is consultant, hematologist, University of Benin Teaching Hospital. Um, we'll go on, go on a break right now. Uh, when we come back, we need to talk about is there a specific diet that this person needs to take in order for them to be able to build up um, some kind of immune system that is needed within them. So we'll be right back after the short break. Don't go nowhere. Many thanks for staying tuned. World Hemophilia Day happens to be every year, 17th of April. Yes, and it's been observed to actually educate us on everything that has to do with hemophilia. Now, before the break, we were talking about diets. Is there a specific diet that these patients, they need to be, um, to take, yes, to undergo? Our uh, regard to diets, they, there is none, really. Okay. Uh, but so they can eat the normal, they can, they can regular eat food. Normal diets, but it's okay. key because of, um, they are losing blood each time they bleed. It's, mm. it's, it's key to have good nutrition. Okay. They should eat well and live well. Mm. That's okay. key. But there's no dietary exemption for persons with hemophilia. Okay. All right. Let, let's talk about um, blood But there may be some exemption okay. to medication mm. use. Mm. Mm. There okay. are some medications that may increase tendency to bleed. Mm. So like some simple pain drugs like... Um, okay. So they I should think avoid them. Okay. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. It's good. Now, um, let's talk about blood transfusion intervention. Um, are they available to hemophilia patients? Yes, the goal of, um, of treatment is to replace the uh, factor that is lacking. And the only way to get that factor, originally, that factor is gotten from, from blood. And depending on the expertise of the facility in charge, blood can be separated into components. So if you have a facility that do not have the capacity to do the separation, mm. the only choice they may have may just to give the child whole blood. Okay. Blood is given just as whole as it is donated. But facilities that have the capacity, this blood can be separated into different components. You could have plasma. Plasma is the part of blood that contains the factor that we need. So if you separate blood, take, about, take out the cells, the plasma can be given to affected persons. Okay. And with appropriate blood bags, you can also further split that plasma into smaller fractions that will get a concentrate of the key factor called the cryoprecipitates. Okay. That component is rich in the factor that is lacking. Mm. So that can be used to safely you know, arrest bleeding in these children. But over time, 
They use, there's been an evolution over the use of blood therapy. With uh, science, they've produced recombinant factors. Mm. Those specific factors lacking, they have produced recombinant forms of them. They are bottled like medications. Okay, so given. they can be given mm. to these children mm -hmm. when they have tendencies to bleed. Okay. All right, so what are the available options? We know most persons, they go abroad to seek medical care and all of that. So what are the available options overseas that we don't have here? Uh, the key option is identify with your doctor locally because if you go abroad, except you have a gene, tra a, 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 a gene transfer. Mm. So without such care, the condition is always there. Okay. So even if you go abroad today that you bled today, mm. by the time you come back, you administer factors there. By the time you go back, the factors have a, a, a half-life, which lasts a couple of days. Mm. By the time the activity wanes, you also will need further support. So the key thing is identify with local groups where you can have a physician uh, to supervise your care and well-being. So okay. if you identify especially with patient groups from mm -hmm. where they can have access to this factor concentrates, mm -hmm. that may really help. Like presently we have some patient population groups and with their group support, they're able to get some factors. And once those factors are available, they come to their doctors at intervals okay. to assess those factors. And some of them actually have been trained to administer the factors themselves so they can live independently and manage their conditions themselves. Okay. So um, let's look at early detection because we know sometimes in Nigeria or we humans, we want to, s to wait to see how it's, it's, it's going. Let's see if this medication is going to solve it. Let's see if that medication is going to solve it. So what are the early detections that you feel, okay, one should hold on to and quickly go get the attention, to seek the attention of the doctor? Now, because it's a genetic condition, it's important to know this. Is there anybody in your family mm. who have a tendency to bleed? Mm. Even not just in your immediate family, in your maternal family, maternal in particular. Are there persons who have lost their lives from bleeding conditions? Mm. That's the first point of alertness. Okay. So if there are persons in your families that have had tendency to bleed, it's important to mm. you especially at childbirth, to so begin to take note of the risk of bleeding, especially in your male children, if we are talking about hemophilia. If you, at the point of circumcision, you seem to observe that your child bled unusually. Okay. It's the first time to seek mm. the doctor's intervention. Mm -hmm. Because if that's identified, it is possible that the child can actually begin to get support and we live normal. The disease also too has a different severities. There are persons who may have mild disease, some may have moderate disease, or some may have severe disease. Patients with severe disease are likely to present early okay. because their tendency to bleed is higher, so mm. they present first. For those with mild disease, they may miss it at the point of circumcision. Mm. Their first detection may be when they are older in life. But once they know that there is somebody in their family who mm. has a tendency to bleed, that's the first clincher. Mm. Once we detect that, we should not take it lightly. At any earliest visit to your physician, you should discuss it mm. so that the physician can refer you appropriately so that you are investigated and possibly you get the needed uh, interventions. Okay, okay. Now, now for an adult, someone that is up to age to walk, now, are there some jobs this person cannot do? Yeah. Access to support really depends, determines how much you can get involved. Mm. In settings where they have factors to correct, to treat them regularly, mm. they actually take these factors pre as a preventive measure. They do not wait to bleed before they take the factors. Mm -hmm. So where they have factors as getting you steadily, they may take up any job. Okay. Because that factor they get regularly may provide all the support they need, even including contact sports. Okay. They can. But where the access is limited, they have to be cautious of that. So they may limit them to certain jobs, especially the sports strenuous or strenuous jobs, jobs yeah. that may require lifting or carrying mm. uh, weighty uh, mm. uh, items. 
So okay. those are the challenges. Okay. So is there any way um, government is trying to advocate for these persons living with hemophilia? There are times really to seek um, government support. Mm. But you know, the key part is government, and government is involved in a lot of things. Yeah. And um, you know, the population of persons affected also determines how much interest government will show in such conditions. And that's probably the essence of this interview. Mm. So that as much as possible, we can tend to aggregate all those numbers of persons were affected. So they also government will see that this is a key population. Yeah. And actually what has helped the disease over time is probably because in the history of the disease, some key families in the globe mm. have been involved. Okay. And that's actually what probably uh, stimulated yes, the kind the of... Day. Yes, the mm. day and probably the mm. kind of support mm. they have gotten mm. in the other parts of mm. the globe. Mm. I also think if possibly uh, we are able to assemble a number of these patient groups, that uh, our government or policymakers will see that this number is significant. Mm. Everybody is important, really. Yeah, sure. But if they see a good number that they can actually be able to show some dedications, either in terms of providing the needed support to get the products or to get testings or basic care mm. in general facilities. So that's, that's really important. Mm. So this also provides us, this podium, this platform yes. also provides an opportunity for us to seek mm. uh, government interventions mm. to persons living with bleeding conditions generally. Mm. They need a lot of support so that they can pull through and live as near normal life mm. as possible. Okay. So is, is it a um, death-threatening disease or ailment? The fact that there's a tendency to bleed into dangerous areas mm. makes it somewhat life-threatening. Mm. Bleeding, for instance, into the brain is a very serious condition yeah. that can actually uh, be life, very life-threatening. Mm. So that's why, if it is possible, we should have all our patients involved, affected, have access to factors as preventive uh, form of therapy, yeah. rather waiting for them to get sick or come with bleeding conditions mm. and then get factors. So the goal is probably getting them to get factors before they even have bleeding. Okay, okay, okay. Now, um, I, we want to look at research. Are there any promising research and endeavors emerging to the treatment of those persons um, living with hemophilia? Are there any research going on right now? Yeah, from our discourse so far, a, a number of research have been done. Our researches are also ongoing. Okay. Okay. Like I did say, we started from giving blood mm. and we have innovated to giving specific factor replacements. They've also innovated to develop bypassing factors, something that will bypass the point where those factors should work. Mm. Okay? And those bypassing agents, they have different generations of them. And they've further gone to as far as developing gene therapies to probably provide, provide a permanent cure Solution. To, yeah. to, to the condition. But as usual, the research will continue because besides specific treatment, transmitting the evidence-based research gotten mm. from treatment into mm. clinical practice is also important. There are therapies for it. Okay. The fact that our patients are not coming forward to be treated, the fact that those who are valuable who are, who are known yeah. are not treated yeah. provides also to research grants. Mm. What are their problems? What are the challenges in assessing these factors? These mm. are form of researches. How can their quality of life be improved mm. so that they can live near normal life? So these are dimensions of researches that are emerging in care of patients with hemophilia. Okay. All right. So in getting access to a doctor, is it as easy as just going to the hospital and you can get access to the, the hematologist? It's like the hospital where we work, the UBTH, mm. it's, it's, it's reasonably easy. Okay. Because at the first point of presentation may be to the general um, practice clinic. Mm. Or probably a person is bleeding, we present first to the emergency units. Yeah. And the doctors of the, at the emergency unit are also well trained. Okay. So they can sort patients according to which specialist do they require. And on the spot, they will put a call to the hematologist okay. who can come and assess them. So every physician in the hospital knows when it's something related to bleeding. Mm. The hematologist is the person to reach out to and promptly do that. 
Okay. But the challenge still remains probably in the interiors or settings where there are no hematologists. And that's where it's important to that the general medical practitioner should have some basic ideas about managing these conditions mm -hmm. and who they should see. Even if it means traveling some distance, they should make attempts to make referrals to the okay. to appropriate physicians mm -hmm. so that they can get comprehensive assessment mm -hmm. and treatment. Okay, and, and a better care and too. Better care too. Okay. okay. Now let's look at the theme for this year: equitable access for all recognizing or bleeding disorder. Are we actually getting that? Or are they actually getting that access? Now, if you look at that team, it's, it's maybe confusing. Okay. The meaning may mean different things. Mm. Equity here does not really mean access to everybody with hemophilia. Mm. The equity here in this team tends to describe access to intervention by every person with bleeding disorder. Mm. We should not isolate hemophilia okay. from the person who has von Willebrand's disease. Mm. Yeah, because that brings to, to, to my next question, what are um, other bleeding disorders that we have apart from hemophilia? hemophilia? But in any case, let's deal with the thing first. So, so we should give mm. attention to all persons with bleeding disorder. That's okay. probably what it means. Yeah. We should give equal attention to, to all, all of forms of bleeding conditions, okay. even beyond hemophilia. Okay. So hemophilia is our primary focus, mm. but every person with a tendency to bleed should receive optimum attention and intervention so that okay. they are properly taken care of. Okay. And any morbidity or mortality related to the condition is arrested. Okay, so what other bleeding disorder do we have? In case someone says, okay, well, um, I, I had a cut on my leg and I am okay, but just maybe leads to, you know, drops yeah. coming out and all that. So what other bleeding disorder do we have apart from hemophilia? It will surprise you to know that there are dozens of bleeding disorders. Okay. Some we classify as genetic, mm -hmm. that's where hemophilia comes on there. Mm -hmm. There are a number of acquired forms, mm -hmm. which are so numerous to mention. Yeah. Now, let me pre talk about the genetic, because there are fewer, and I can probably handle that uh, within, within a the short space time. of time. Yeah. Now, like I tried to explain the layers of arresting blood clots. A defect in the first layer, which is a defect in blood vessel, can result to a tendency to bleed. Blood vessel disorders include both genetic and acquired conditions. Mm. There are a number of conditions that can affect our blood vessels. Okay. Something as simple as not having enough vitamin C mm. in your system can give you scurvy. And when you brush, you bleed. Yeah. Okay? Now, there's a group of people to um, elderly persons, mm. as they age, or even pregnant women. You may just have some innocent bleed because of the fragility mm. of their vessel wall. Yes. Some may not really be something serious. Mm. There are people who take hormonal agents. That can make their blood vessels a little more fragile mm. and increase their tendency mm. to bleed. For those affecting platelets, there are both genetic conditions, acquired conditions that can affect our platelets. And a great so many of them are not known. Mm. And that's why we may term them as idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Okay. A plectoral is common. Mm. You see, people will just say they have something like mosquito bites on their yes, skin. Yes. You see blood dots everywhere. Mm, mm. It's a pointer. Your platelets may be low. Mm. You should see your doctor. Females who have their menses lasting longer than usual, okay. they should see their doctor. Okay. Or women who are postmenopausal mm. and they are bleeding, mm. they should make attempts to see their doctor. doctor. Or you have a cut and you think, it's something that should just stop spontaneously, but mm. it's lasting longer. Yeah. You should make attempts to see your doctor. Mm. There are some conditions that may be infectious. There are general infective conditions that may weaken our clotting system mm. and increase our tendency to bleed. A mm. common one around that we often experience the epidemics are the viral hemorrhagic fever. They affect the strength of our blood vessels mm. and increase tendencies to bleed. Okay, there are other many a lot of medical conditions, some also drugs mm. that we take. Pain drugs, something as simple as the NSAIDs, the non steroidal anti inflammatory drug, mm. a common over the counter drug that every one of us takes. Mm. Some just take it, it erodes their stomach, mm. they pass black, uh, uh, black stool. Okay, so a key number of factors can 
affects our tendency to form clots mm -hmm. and that can result into abnormal bleeds. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Benedict. And uh, we'll say thank you for educating us today on Ward Hemophilia Day. Uh, we want you to advise parents, individuals out there to on things as regards um, issues with blood disorder, your advice to them. And also some doctors, because we know that some of them, they, they might not actually know this is what is happening to this patient and start diagnosing or giving different uh, prescriptions, Therapy. yes, which it ought not to be. My general advice to the general population, especially to parents, is to be uh, not to undermine every bleeding presentation or symptoms in a child. Mm. Especially, not even in your own child, if you have a family member who bleeds, Okay. Especially mothers, mm. you have people from your uh, uh, from your lineage mm. that have tendency to bleed. There is a tendency to that your own children may be affected. Mm. So it's important when you have children, you should monitor them. And once okay. you notice that there is a risk, do not hesitate. Don't self-medicate. Mm. Do not hesitate to visit the hospital to seek attention. Okay. For persons who have any suspicion whether they may be in this category, mm. they should also not hesitate. It's safer to come and be screened. Yeah. And if you are negative, mm. you are better off. Mm. If you are also positive and you require to be in any intervention, it's also safer. Mm. It makes you live a little more healthier mm. than you would have been. So yeah. that's my general advice to the, uh, to the, the uh, to the populace. Yeah. To physician groups, as you already have been indicated in your med school, the how to manage this. Please, it's important to, mm -hmm. to reach out to your colleagues who are experts in, in the specialty of hematology mm -hmm. and management of blood disorders. Mm -hmm. Do not hesitate to send your patient promptly to get intervention from the hematology or to a facility where they can get appropriate care. You can also do well, especially on days like this, to pick up some leaflets or general uh, uh, information circulating yeah. in the media mm. to learn a little more about bleeding disorders mm. so that you are better prepared mm. to manage patients and support them. Mm. The patient you refer to get care will be happier yeah. than one you kept doing all you can I tell and you. could not support yes. that. Awareness, awareness is key. It's very key. It's very key. Thank all right, you thank much. you so much, Dr. Mwongo Benedict, for taking out your time to lecture us today on Ward Hemophilia Day. Now, remember, Ward Hemophilia Day was first celebrated on the 17th of April, which happens to be today, 1989, by the Ward Federation of Hemophilia. Now, you know, you have a court on your leg or wherever, you just need to go seek the attention of a doctor and you will definitely be taken to the appropriate um, locations or hematologist. All right, thank you so much. Till we'll be seen again next week for another exciting time on Flipside. Do have yourself a blessed day. Bye for now.